This morning we are beginning a new series in Paul's, on Paul's letter to Titus, as you may have figured out here. Uh, you can turn to Titus already. I'm just going to give you give a little introduction kind of to the series. A few reasons why we're doing a series on Titus at this point in the church's life. Well, as we jump into this new church, uh, we want to set the direction that we are heading. We want to be reminded of some fundamental principles that are laid out for us in Scripture in what church looks like. Some really some cornerstones that need to be laid that will create the foundation that we will build a structure upon. If we build a structure first and then try to put in foundations, uh, it's hard. If you've ever done house rentals like that, it's it's a lot of work. You got to lift. The, the parallels don't work exactly, but it doesn't work quite as well. So we want to build the foundation. But secondly, we didn't want to do a topical series um, at this point. We, we kind of just did a topical series on the solas, but we believe the main diet of a church should be what is called sequential exposition. Big words for in the morning. What does that mean? Exposition essentially means you take the message of a passage of scripture and that becomes the message of the sermon. So all six sermons that have been preached so far here have been that. We've, we've looked, we've opened our Bibles to a specific passage, and that's where we've gotten the message out of. But we also kind of arranged it topically, didn't we? We, we were doing the five solos. There's nothing wrong with that per se. Uh, even a totally topical sermon is okay at, at some point. But we believe the main diet should be sequential exposition or, or preaching through the verses and the sections that make up a particular book of the Bible. That really prevents us from hearing about one person's hobby horses over and over. That would be my hobby horses. You don't want to hear about that every Sunday. It prevents us from avoiding the hard parts. It really allows us to hear the whole counsel of God. And we chose Titus because it allows us to preach through a book, but it also gives us some of these cornerstone foundation pieces that we need to begin a church. The letter of Titus was written by Paul to Titus, who was on the island of Crete, so that he might strengthen the new churches that they had planted together. Is there a little bit of feedback in my mind? I'm going to change that. Let's see if that is better. All right. So basically, Paul and Titus had, had gone into Crete on the island, and they had they'd gone through the island preaching the gospel, and there's a bunch of converted people, a bunch of Christians on the island. And then Paul took off, and he left Crete. Uh, he left Tim, Titus, he left Titus in Crete so that he could organize these churches or these Christians into local churches. And so that, that's basically where we're at with this letter. Titus is there. He's, he's organizing these churches, and so he's getting these foundational pieces of how to build a healthy church as he is ministering to new churches. Now, our church is also new. It's not new in exactly the same way. But I think Titus is actually a little bit close to our, our present situation. And so in the coming weeks, we want to dig into this letter. We want to see what God is saying to the church through the words of Paul. And so I would like to invite you and challenge you to memorize the book of Titus. You may have never thought of that before. You say memorizing a book of the Bible is impossible. I can't do it. That's what you're thinking. That's not true. It's not true. There might, there might be some of you who actually can't and don't feel bad about that. So some people have specific learning challenges, memorization challenges. God will only hold you accountable to what you can do. But most of us can memorize Titus. I promise you. Let me ask you, how many, how many songs do you know off by heart? Lots. If you listen to your favorite station, you will find you know the songs. If I ask you about your, your hobbies or your interests, how much can you tell me about those things? Lots. You can memorize Titus. I once heard an 18-year-old, part of the Bontrager family, who, who came through. 
And he was spouting off whole psalms, like he wasn't even thinking about it. He was just reciting them. Turned out he'd memorized like half the New Testament. And I was embarrassed because I was a 30, how old was I? 33-year-old preacher who hadn't memorized nearly close to what he had. And so I, I thought I would try it. I didn't think I could because I was old, right? And yeah, that's right. For, for this church, I'm old. So uh, I, I was old and I always thought I wasn't good at memorizing and I'm probably not. But I just tried and I found out that it worked. I ended up memorizing Romans 1 to 9 and almost all of Ephesians. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that because you can do that too. If I can do it, you can do it. I have a very poor short-term memory. You know how many times I've asked you your names. And so you can do that as well. I'm going to uh, fire out an email this week about some tips for memorizing Scripture. But it's basically just uh, four verses a, a week will definitely keep you on pace. And you can do it. Okay. If you're going to do it, let me know so we can uh, keep each other accountable. Did anyone do verse 1 to 4 already? Ah, a few. Good, good. Linda sort of did. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Half is better is 10 times better than zero. All right, so we are going to begin this series by actually preaching through the, the entire letter. So I want to I ask you to stand this time, because it's difficult for some to stand that long. But we'll read the entire letter, letter of Paul to Titus. I'm reading in the English Standard Version. Oh, you are standing anyways, okay. Um, that's good. I'm reading the English Standard Version. Feel free to follow in your own translation if you want, or if that's distracting for you, you can also just, just listen as well. I sometimes do that. But we're going to read the, the, Paul's letter to Titus. This is what the Holy Spirit says. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as tossed, so that he might be able to give sound or instruction in sound doctrine, and also rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you... Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. 
bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all unlawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Consider these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority, so that no one disregards you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need, and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this letter that we can listen in on, Lord, from Paul to Titus so long ago. In a place different from ours, people different from us, and yet your word speaks today as clearly as it did then. We pray, Lord, that we would have ears to hear and hearts that are desirous to trust and to obey. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we're not going to preach the entire book of Titus, although sort of we will. We're going to focus on verses 1 to 4 this morning, so you can flip back to that, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This, this week I spent a few days at a, a workshop called the Charles Simeon Trust Preaching Workshop in Winnipeg, and one of the things they teach us there is that each book of the Bible has what they call a melodic line. Melodic line. If, if you're into music, you'll, you'll understand what that means. It's, a, it's this... This kind of this musical refrain that keeps repeating throughout a, a piece of music. There's this theme that kind of ties it all together. And we know a certain movies by the music we hear, right? There's a Star Wars theme or the Lord of the Rings theme and different themes for different parts of the movies. And these things remind us of this, this continuing theme. It's like this, this drum beat, the, the melody that flows through a piece. And each book of the Bible has that same thing. It has a melodic line, a, a particular way in which the themes have been arranged in order to give us an overarching message of the book. I wonder if you heard some of those as we read through it. We once uh, were driving to Selkirk and Lindsay read Titus, uh, which we just did, and we, we both said, the word good works comes up a lot. And you hear that, you pick up on these themes as you, 
go through, and I just encourage you to, to be reading Titus frequently. You can read it once a day, and it'll only take you maybe five minutes or seven minutes, and you'll really start to hear those, those melodies as you go. Now, in verses 1 to 4, we have that melody, we have the themes of the book really compressed into four verses. We, we have here the entire message of the book, in some ways, in just four verses of the book, because Paul likes to do that at the beginning. He likes to give us his theme, give us the message, and then the whole rest of the book, he's expanding it. He's, he's magnifying it under a glass and saying, this, this is really what I mean by this. Now, you might word the theme differently if you were to study this for a while and, and come up with the, the melodic line of Titus, but this is what I came up with, truth that transforms the church. Uh, I think that summarizes what he, Titus is talking about. That's the main theme, and then there's sub-themes that come under there that support this main theme. And so this morning we want to look at five themes that we find in these first four verses of Titus and see how they work together to give us a key cornerstone for what we need in the church. We're going to see these five points. The gospel is God's gospel. The gospel transforms. The gospel uh, promises. The gospel unites. And the gospel saves. So that's where we're going this morning. Five main points. So first, the gospel is God's gospel. In verse 1 to 4, this theme really takes up the majority of the space, or almost half of the space, is Paul defending his authority. And ultimately, he's defending the truth of the gospel that he preaches. We see this in verse 1. Paul says, Paul, a servant of God. He doesn't merely mean that he's doing the will of the Lord, or that he's He's trying to please the Lord, although that's part of it. I think he's connecting here with an Old Testament idea. Moses was called a servant of God. And Moses spoke for God. He spoke with God's authority. And that's what Paul's getting at. He, he is a servant of God. He's a messenger of God. He also calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. The apostles were men who had seen the risen Christ and were specifically commissioned by him to be the pillars and the foundations of the early church. They were to proclaim the gospel and establish the truth of the churches. And so that's who Paul is. And then in verse 2, he says, The hope of the gospel was promised before the ages began. So it was God promised this long ago, but at the proper time it's manifested, it's made known in his word through the preaching with which I, Paul, have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. And so Paul's saying here, I've been entrusted with this, with this gospel by the command of God. I'm a servant of God. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a preacher by the command of God. Why does he make such a big deal out of that in these early verses? Is he egocentric? Does he think everything has to be about him? That is, that is not the idea. This is about the gospel he preaches, not about the man preaching it. The gospel that Paul preaches is not a message that comes from man's ideas, but a message that comes from God. That's his main point. He is God's servant. He is sent by Jesus. He's a, a preacher of God's gospel by the command of God. His, his gospel he preaches is not merely the best idea that he's heard, but it is God's own word. He defends this also in Galatians chapter 1 verse 12. There he actually devotes about half a chapter to this idea, but he says there, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me was not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel that Paul preaches is God's gospel. Now, why does that matter so much? Well, we see, as we read through Titus, there, is, there was false teachers that have, had already started to creep into these churches. 
new church, new churches in, in Crete, they already have false teachers. And they were preaching a gospel that contradicted Paul's gospel. And so if anyone preaches another gospel, that secondary gospel, that, that new gospel, must be rejected. The problem with false gospels isn't that we just get confused and we're like, well, it's hard to function with two different messages. The problem is that, is that one comes from God and the other doesn't. And so any message that, that doesn't come from God and presents itself as a, as a separate message of salvation must be rejected because it's in opposition to the message of God. This is why we don't unite ourselves with, with um, individuals or churches that call themselves Christians but believe a totally different gospel. We don't unite ourselves with false gospels because they originate in the teachings of men and therefore are opposed to the true gospel. All false gospels must be rejected. One of the reasons for Paul in this letter especially, or in maybe others as well, but why he is so emphatic on this that we need to get the one gospel right is because a false gospel will not produce a godly life. That is always Paul's aim, Paul's burden, is godly living. So the false teaching that was going on in Crete was drawing people away from the hope of the gospel, and as they went away from the gospel, they became ungodly in their living. In chapter 1, verse 16, he's describing these, these people. He says they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They were detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good works. Their false teaching did not accord with godliness. And so the message for us is that if we want to be a church pleasing to the Lord, we must hold fast to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. If we want to be pleasing to the Lord without holding fast to the saints, we will not be. In His Word, God has revealed everything we need for life and godliness. And so if we add to the Word, we're going to be led astray into disobedience. If we take away from the Word, we're going to be led astray into disobedience. The aim of the church is not to look around at all the ideas of the world and try to figure out what's, what's going to work, right? How, how, how can we grow our church? How can we grow the budget through worldly means? That's a, the, the, the burden of so many churches today. No, our goal is to say, what has God said? And how can we do it? What is that, what's that going to look like here to obey what God has said so clearly? In the church, the, the truth of the Bible, the, the gospel once for all delivered to the saints must be central. Now we move on to see that the gospel that comes from God is a gospel that transforms. This is really the backbone of this, of this book. We've noticed how many times Titus says good works over and over. Devote yourselves to good works. And at the same time, there's almost an equal emphasis on defining the true gospel and on arguing against the false teachers. And so it, it's truth that transforms, it's, it's gospel that transforms. We, we see this in verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. What we have here is a purpose of Paul's writing to Titus. He says, I'm writing to you there to, to strengthen the faith of God's elect, of those who have come to believe in Jesus Christ. How is he going to strengthen their faith? By increasing their knowledge of the truth. And what kind of truth is that? It's a truth that accords with godliness. It's a truth that produces godliness. It, godliness flows out of this truth. That is the message of his book. We could say his message is healthy teaching creates healthy churches. Sick teaching creates sick churches. The gospel transforms the church. And that teaching really protects us from two errors that are so prevalent in churches today. 
two wrong paths that we can go down as Christians. The, the first wrong path is intellectualism. Intellectualism. Basically, the, the worship of doctrines for their own sake. So have you ever met a Christian who is always eager to talk about theology but doesn't have seem to have been transformed by it at all? Some people love a theological debate, but they don't love people. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Paul talks about knowledge that, that puffs up instead of building up. There's a way of knowing truth that makes us proud, and it keeps us interested. It, we, we like it, but it never moves down from the brain into the heart and then out through the hands and go to work. So it's, it's just ideas. It's just mental exercises. And here's Titus. We're, we're steered away from that path. Paul says, true knowledge of God will accord with godliness. It will produce a life of good works. This is why the pattern of Paul's teaching is so often, at the beginning of the book, he'll talk doctrine, he'll talk theology, and at the second half of the book, he'll say, therefore, live this way. The, the theology must live out, or it is not there at all. And so intellectualism, or, or truth for the sake of truth, is, is going to make church is sick. So maybe you're here today and you're, you're really loving that part. You say, yes, yes, down with this theological nitpicking. Let, let's just love Jesus and love one another and not worry too much about, about what's true and what's not true. That's probably where a lot of churches are today. Paul corrects us here too, doesn't he? The second wrong path he addresses is anti-intellectualism. I don't know if you've come across that. Anti-intellectualism says we don't need to be very concerned about what's true or false. We just need to do good things. That's all that matters. I love a quote from Tim Keller. He says, To say doctrine doesn't matter, only how you live matters, is itself a doctrine. It's the doctrine of salvation by works. He's absolutely right. Just works without doctrine is, is no doctrine at all. It's, well, it is a doctrine. It's a doctrine of self-righteousness. And so the entire letter of Titus is an argument that if we don't have truth, neither will there be good works. Truth is the vehicle that takes us to the destination of a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And so here Paul calls our attention to the knowledge of the truth that accords with godliness. It, it's not truth over here, and then over here we have a, have a life that's not connected. And it's, neither is it a life pursuit of good works. And well, truth really doesn't matter. We're just going to marginalize that. No, it, it's truth that works. Truth that transforms the church. And so then we kind of get into the heart of that and ask, how does it transform the church? How does the gospel actually transform the church? What goes on in our brains and in our hearts, about the things that we know to be true about the gospel that actually changes us. So what, what, what do I need to know as a Christian to, to really genuinely love that guy in the pew across the church that I don't really like that much? You know, What actually do I need to know that's going to change me that way? The answer is in verse 2. Paul writes, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, the knowledge of the truth that accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life. What we see here is a gospel that promises. The gospel promises eternal life to us. Now what Paul is saying is not that he, he hopes that the church will have eternal life, is this is not a desire of, of him. He's, he's not wishful thinking or something like that. that. That's how we use the word hope. Hope is the certainty in our hearts when we believe something truly. That, that's the experience of hope. It's this, it's this confidence. The other day I was driving home from, from that preaching workshop. It was about 4.30 or 5 or something. And I was driving home and, and, and I saw the golden arches as I was driving home. But I believed in my heart that there was food at home waiting for me. I hadn't seen it. I didn't even know what it was going to be. I had no idea, but experience tells me there's food at home. And so 
that that faith in the food at home was my hope that there was going to be food so I didn't have to stop at McDonald's and eat whatever it is that they put in their packaging. And because of that hope, uh, I was able to, to drive right past. I was barely even tempted. Now the next day I stopped at McDonald's. That's a different story. It was 11, late at night. There was no supper waiting for me. Um, but in, our, in a similar way, I think, our, it is our hope in eternal life that transforms today. It's a hope for the future that transforms now. Uh, turn with me to Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Paul, how do we live lives of godliness today in the present age? Paul's answer is by remembering that we are waiting for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to fix our gaze on heaven. We are to fix our eyes on eternity with Jesus Christ. When future glory with Christ for all eternity, when that is our single gaze, our single hope, our single purpose, we can far more easily say no to the pleasures of the world. They don't offer us anything anymore. We have eternity of glory. We won't need to bite and devour one another. We won't need to... to seek self in this life. We will be able to seek others because we say, I will inherit the world. I don't need my money now. I don't need my time now. I don't need my pleasures now. Then we can, we can pass by McDonald's, as it were, and go home to pierogies and farmer sausage, which is what was waiting for me. I'm a blessed man. It's this, this hope that transforms us. There's a phrase that goes like this. It says, Christians are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. I don't know if you've heard that. I think what that means is, is Christians are so busy being self-centered and hanging out in little groups that they are useless to society. And I think to some extent that's true at times. Um, but it's not because they're too heavenly minded. It's because they're too earthly minded. This phrase it really is, we need to be so heavenly minded that we are of some earthly good. When we are truly heavenly minded, that's when we're going to be useful in the world. What motivated Christ? Jesus, for who for the joy set before him, the joy of the future, his glory coming, for that joy he endured the cross. He, he despised the shame, he was seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Just like Jesus, we need to keep our hope on what is to come. The glory is to come. That's what's going to move us into obedience. Now, the gospel of God that transforms by giving us a hope is the gospel that unites the church. The gospel that unites the church. Look at me in verse 4 of chapter 1. He says, To Titus, my true child in a common faith. True child in a common faith, Titus is to him. There's a unity between them that was based in the gospel. Who are these people? Well, Paul is a Jew of Jews, right? He was circumcised on the eighth day from the tribe of Benjamin. As to the law, blameless. Then there was Titus. Titus was a Gentile. He was not a Jew in any sense of the word possible. And at that time, Jews hated Gentiles. Gentiles were godless, they were vile, they were horrible, lawless creatures in their eyes. And the and Gentiles thought exactly the same way about the Jews. They thought the Jews were atheistic because they didn't believe in all the gods. They thought they were a menace to society. But in Christ, 
Titus is Paul's true child. They share a faith. It says, he's my true child in a common faith. We, we share this faith together. What makes them the same is that they're both hopeless sinners before God who are rescued for eternal life by the death of a Jewish carpenter on a Gentile cross. They are united in that. They were not united in race or in age or geographical location. They were not united in hobbies or political parties or taste in music. They had no unity except in the truth of the gospel. And in the gospel, they were not only united, they were brothers. They were partners and fellow workers in the ministry. They were one family in the gospel. In this room, we have people from all over the place, don't we? People from north, north of Petersfield and even Gillum today. South in Neverville. We have people born from all over the world. Russia, Mexico, Canada, United States, any other countries? Germany. Germany. All over the place. We have people from innumerable, innumerable religious backgrounds. We have Mennonite, Amish, Hutterite, United, Reformed. Anglican, Roman Catholic, Atheist, Secular, and even maybe some Baptist backgrounds. Probably the fewest Baptist backgrounds of anybody. But here we are. The only thing that will truly bind us together in unity is not because we all like to hang out in funeral homes. That's not going to do it. Although it's beautiful here. The thing that will unite us is the gospel. That the Son of God has died for us creating for himself one new man in place of the two, breaking down the wall of hostility by his blood. In Christ, we are not individual Christians who happen to just come here together because this is where there's preaching, this is where there's music, and it's warm. We come here because we're united in the faith. The gospel unites. You know, it's so often said, uh, the truth divides. People argue that. The, the truth divides. Let's not talk about doctrine in, in, in the church because it's going to be divisive. Well, the gospel does divide. It, it divides between people who believe it and who don't believe it. And we need that division. The, the church must be divided from the world in that way. But the, the gospel will not divide the church. It will unify the church. And finally now, go the gospel... God's gospel is the gospel that saves. It's the gospel that saves. Look at me at the second half, verse 4. He says, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. That phrase is pretty familiar to us. It's, it's slightly different from Paul's usual phrasing. Usually he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is basically a familiar phrase. It's so familiar we think, oh, this is just the greeting. We just skip over this. Uh, I was once in a church that preached through, through Titus, and, and they started in verse 5. They, they skipped the, the beginning, the heart of the message. And the grace and peace really is the heart of the message here. It's in every letter that Paul writes. He begins his letter with grace to you, and he ends his letter with grace be with you. You can, if, you, if you're still open to Titus 1, you can look... At the end of 2 Timothy, it's on your page there. It says, grace be with you. Every letter, all 13, end the same way. And so, we need to know that this is important for Paul, not secondary. And what does this mean? Grace and peace. Is this just like, be well and have a good day? No. Grace and peace are the summary of the gospel. They're the summary of everything that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And so by grace, we have been saved. Grace is God's work in saving Christians against what they deserve. It's God's action that saves us. And, and peace is, is the result. In, in the gospel, we have peace in, in two ways. First, we have peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we came to Christ, by faith, we didn't have peace with God. We were at enmity with God. We hated Him, and He was our enemy because of our sin and our rebellion. 
Our, the Bible says our sin separates us from a holy God. But in the gospel, Christ bore the wrath of God for our sin on the cross so that when we trust in him, our sins are removed. The enmity is removed and we are reconciled to God. The goal of the gospel is not forgiveness of sin. Did you know that? It's necessary. The goal of the gospel is reconciliation with God. We must be forgiven to be reconciled, but to know God is the goal. And that is the gospel itself. That Christ died for our sins so that we might be reconciled with God. And if you're here today and you don't know that message or you haven't embraced it by faith, you need to do that. If you're here this morning and you have not been reconciled with God, that means you're at enmity with God and He is at enmity with you. And if you should die on your way home, you will not spend eternity with God, but apart from Him in torment. Make peace with God. Be reconciled to God. And at the same time, the Gospel also recon reconciles us with one another. We also have peace with one another. Uh, turn with me to, to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. This glorious gospel of peace with one another. You'll notice as we read through, it's kind of mixed together. Is he talking about peace with God or peace with each other? The answer is yes. Ephesians 2, verse 14 to 16. For he, this is Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility that glorious as we are reconciled to God we are reconciled to one another we are both reconciled together through the cross, to God. And so reconciliation with one another in the family of God is not a second step. It's not a thing that happens after conversion. It is part and parcel of reconciliation with God. Our job as Christians is not to create unity in the church. The Bible says we are united in the church. Our task is to preserve that unity, to maintain it, to, to keep it through love. And so Paul is stating here what, what he hopes will be accomplished in his writing to Titus and, of course, by extension to us. He wants his message to be a vehicle of God's grace and peace. Grace to you and peace from God and from Christ Jesus, our Savior. The church is called out of the world by the proclamation of the gospel, by, by the words of Scripture. The church is gathered together by the words of Scripture. The church is united by, by Scripture. The church is sanctified and purified by the Word. And finally, the church is, is kept by the Word. From beginning to end, Paul's writing and, and all the other apostles and prophets' writing are God's vehicle of grace and peace in the church. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a truth that transforms the church. The gospel is the very foundation of the church. In Ephesians 2, verse 20, Paul says, Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone of the church, and the apostles and the prophets are the foundation. What does he mean by all that? Well, well, the, the gospel, or Jesus Christ himself, is the, the chief cornerstone. He, he is the center. He is to which everything else points. Everything that we do and are as a church must be shaped by the truth of Christ dying and resurrecting for sinners. If we do anything that doesn't have any connection to that, we need to stop doing those things. They're, they're not, they don't belong in the church. And the hope of eternal life that grows out of that, these things must govern our lives together. And then we have the teaching of the apostles and the prophets as the foundation. The only reason we know why the gospel should shape the church is because of the writings of the apostles and the prophets. And these things create the foundation of the church, the written scriptures. 
And so the foundations of the church are, are gospel shaped. And as we go through, we see how the gospel relates to all the different things we do. And we see how it relates to church leadership, church discipleship, and even church discipline. It is in the word of God we find this foundation. It is the truth of the word that transforms the church. And so as we begin this series and as I close out this message, I want to just leave us with some questions to consider. Some questions to consider. Would a visitor to our church know that we preach God's gospel and not the commands of men? Would they see that when they come in and experience whatever happens here, both from the front and in the back as we fellowship? Would they see that the truth of the gospel transforms us? Would they see changes happening in individual hearts and lives and their lives together? We could ask this, what, what part of our life together as a church needs to be conformed to the commands of God? The church, we need to be always transforming. If we think we've arrived, we're probably a lot farther away than we would want to be from health. We need to always be transforming. How, how, do we, how might we need to do that? Another question, is, is there some place where we have let worldly thinking replace biblical truth in how we live together as a church? And if someone would visit our church, would they be able to see that we have the hope of eternal life? Would they visit this place, which is, of course, this people, and would they say, these people are living for something that I don't understand? They're not obsessed with money and, and popularity and fame, but they're living for a hope outside of this world. Would they see that if they'd come? May we be a church that is so transformed by the truth of the gospel that the world around us would say, Something's different here. There's something different. And that we would be a faithful witness to the gospel that we profess. Let's pray.